So this week we begin the second book of the Bible in Sunday School. After a number of weeks in Genesis, we have now moved on to Exodus. We're going to be spending three weeks in Exodus, beginning today with Exodus chapter 3. So most of you know the Moses story pretty well. Uh, we're just jumping right into the burning bush in Exodus 3. We're, so we're skipping over the whole infancy narrative. Moses is a baby in a basket in the Nile River, raised in the palace <clears throat> by the, the Pharaoh, um, or the Pharaoh's daughter who finds him in the river. Uh, he kills the guy, he runs away from Egypt, he ends up in Midian, and that's where we join this lesson with 80-year-old Moses tending the flocks, minding his own business, and then one day noticing this bush that burns. And I suppose it's probably not terribly unusual to see something on fire, uh, but uh, when you're tending sheep day after day, but what is strange is that the fire doesn't consume the bush. It just keeps burning and burning and burning. And finally Moses says, uh, this is weird. I'm going to go investigate. And he comes close to the bush. The bush speaks to him. And it's evident right from the beginning that the voice coming from this fire is God himself. And Moses is terrified as any of us would be in such a, such a shocking turn of events. But, uh, the Lord speaks to Moses in the midst of his fear. In verse 7, God starts talking to Moses. <clears throat> he says to Moses, I've seen what's going, in, going down on Egypt. It's time for this to stop. My people are afflicted down there. They are in slavery. Things are not going well for the descendants of Joseph, who you know, we had the Joseph story last week. It's worth noting 400 years have passed. And that's something you're going to want to make clear to your kids. Like, we're jumping forward 400 years at this point. And, and uh, things are not good anymore for Joseph's... Well, it, actually, I, I shouldn't say that. In one respect, things are very good. The promise God has made to Abraham is starting to be fulfilled. <clears throat> there are a multitude of descendants who have come from the family of Abraham through the line of Jacob and his 12 children... Now there's, they're starting to be as countless as the sands on the seashore and the stars in the sky, as God promised Abraham. Uh, and that's one thing, is, as we go from the end of Genesis to the beginning of Exodus, we have 400 years where God is in some respects silent. We, we don't hear from God in those 400 years. But God is still active in those 400 years. We can, we can tell that based on the demographics of the nation. God is blessing this people to increase and multiply and be fruitful. And that's what God is up to in this particular time period. <clears throat> so there are stretches in history where God was vocal through speaking through prophets. In the latter days, he spoke through his son. But um, we, we, uh, we expect God to be at work at all times. And he was, and sometimes the ways he's at work are somewhat hidden or a little hard to discern for the people of the world, but yeah, that nonetheless he is at work and now it's time for the next phase in God's plan now he's really going to get to work and he wants to do so through Moses and this is what kind of blows Moses's mind why me which probably would be a question any one of us would have if God were to approach us Moses <clears throat> is actually the humblest man on the face of the earth and I don't say that with uh without reason the Bible actually says as much in the book of Numbers there's actually a verse that says Moses is the humblest man on the face of the earth. So, uh, and who wrote that again? No, oh, that's a conversation for a different day. Moses says to God, how can I be the one? Which actually kind of reminds me a little bit of what one of Moses' um, uh, country uh, women would say years later when Mary wonders how she can be the chosen one. But <clears throat> Moses says, how can I be the one? And God's answer is such a great answer. I will be with you. <laughs> and this will be a sign that I've sent you. <clears throat> One day you're going to come back on this mountain and worship me. <clears throat> so what God is saying here is you are not special, Moses, but I am. <laughs> and I'm going to be at work through you. And so it's nothing that makes you special. Now, in Moses' background, God had prepared him for this moment through his time in Egypt, uh, growing up in the Pharaoh's household, and even his time in Midian, 
shepherding and learning some things from his father-in-law Jethro that would come in handy when he becomes the leader of a great nation. He has been groomed and prepared by God. Little does he know for what the task is ahead of him. But the short answer to Moses' question is, I will be the one who will actually deliver the people through you. And Moses then has another question. Moses says, well, what if I get down to Egypt and they don't know who you are? I say, my God says that uh, you should let the people go, Pharaoh. And who, who should I tell Pharaoh is, is my God? Because <clears throat> in the ancient world, Moses grew up in Egypt, so he'd know this as well as anybody. And actually, we still have a lot of surviving records from Egypt. We know about their theology, their religions. They believed in a lot of gods. We have, I mean, you can go on Wikipedia if you want and read about all of them. Uh, it does come in handy when we get to the plagues. Maybe we'll talk about some of those gods in a week or two. But for now, just know that uh, there's, in Egypt, this idea that there's a lot of gods. Now, we know there's only one god, but how is our god special? So remember, Moses' question originally was, how, how, how am I special? And God's answer is, you're not. <clears throat> but then... God, what makes you special? And here we get a really important identifying characteristic for God. Exodus 3.14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. Which to us may, maybe doesn't sound like um, it really tells us very much. But uh, in the Hebrew, what this really means is <clears throat> I am sovereign and I am the one who accomplishes things. I am the one who makes things happen. I am, I am the one who doesn't just speak, but my speaking accomplishes matters. And so basically the, the message for Pharaoh is, my God is the one who does stuff. <laughs> my God is the one who makes things happen. My God is the one who accomplishes things. And then God says something rather interesting about how he wants to be known from this time forward. He says to Moses, gather the elders of Israel and explain this to them, that I am the God of your fathers. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So let's be clear on that. I'm the same God that, well, your Sunday school kids have been learning about for several weeks now. And now I am going to make myself known more specifically as Yahweh. Now, this is the holy name of God that is used throughout the Old Testament, the name of Yahweh. Again, the one who makes things happen. And even you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob may not have had access to this name. This is a, this is a, a new way of, of knowing God and understanding him. And this name, um, it's, it's kind of a shame what our translations have done there was a tradition and in the Hebrew language to not use the vowels when you wrote out the holy name of Yahweh. And, and so they, they actually would often substitute in their manuscripts. They would actually write then the, uh, the word um, for Lord instead, Adani. It was A-D-O-N-I is the name for Lord. And so we've adopted that tradition in a lot of our translations where we put the word Lord in the Bible. But really a better translation would be Yahweh, or the one who makes things happen, the great I am, um, many ways of actually thinking about that name. And this is clear when you read your Bible. This is something maybe, especially for the older kids, to really let them know when they're reading the Bible, and they see the word Lord in all capitals. <clears throat> the original isn't just the word Lord. When you see it in all capitals, this is the holy name of God, Yahweh, the one who accomplishes the one who does stuff, the one who makes things happen. So God says, when you get to, down to Egypt, tell Pharaoh, I am who I am, the God who does stuff. He will accomplish what he says. <clears throat> go let my people go. And then God gives Moses a heads up. And just so you know, he's not going to listen to you. I want you to tell him anyway, because I have a plan here. I'm going to use his disobedience in order to really make a point. And that'll pick up with uh, next week's lesson. We'll get to the point that God wants to make when Moses goes down to Egypt. You know, God is always up to something. Even if people are resisting him, even if people are rejecting him, 
This is still part of God's, God will use this. I mean, when the people rejected Jesus, you know, what did God do? He used that to arrange the salvation of the entire world. So don't, don't be discouraged if God's kingdom is met with rejection. God will use that rejection to bring out good. And the ultimate good here, he says, I'm going to rescue the people from slavery. I'm going to stretch out my arm, rescue them from slavery. In fact, you're going to come back with more than what you left with. You're going to plunder the Egyptians. You're going to have riches and treasures as you leave Egypt. All right, so what does the story tell us? Um, what does the story tell us about who God is? Actually, that's kind of the main thing here. We learn quite a bit about God from this chapter. We learn that he is sovereign. We learn his holy name. We learn what he accomplishes. We learn that he accomplishes things even through resistance and, and opposition. We learn that he calls people, that he chooses to work through people like Moses. God didn't need Moses, but God chose to work through Moses. And we do learn that one of God's great works <clears throat> that he is intent to accomplish is rescue, redemption. In fact, if you have to take the Bible as a whole <clears throat> and boil down themes, what are the great themes in the Bible? I would say there are two great themes in the Bible. God's work in creation and God's work in redemption. <clears throat> God's <clears throat> provision providence <clears throat> through the created world and also God's ability to rescue his people from whatever they've gotten themselves into creation and redemption so this chapter is previewing for us the redemptive work of God his people are in slavery he is going to rescue them from slavery and this also prefigures for us the greater redemption work of God accomplished through Christ we are enslaved to sin, death, and the devil without the hope of freeing ourselves. We are oppressed without the ability to, to do anything to make our situation even the slightest bit better. But God says to us, I'm going to send you a rescuer. And whereas once he sent Moses to rescue the people from slavery, in these latter days he has sent his son. He has sent Jesus to rescue us from slavery. So Moses' work does prefigure Christ. Moses points to the much greater work that the greater prophet would do. And one of Moses' last words is a prediction. There's going to come a prophet greater than me. And that prophet has come. His name was Jesus. And he has accomplished the re redemption of the, of the entire nation of those who belong to the kingdom of God. At one point, God says to Moses, I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt. And this, this prefigures Jesus stretching out his hand on the cross, being crucified, in order that we might be rescued, in order that the devil may be struck. So we are ransomed, we are redeemed, and that's one of the great themes in Exodus 3. What does the story tell us about how, who we are as God's people? We are enslaved we are, at least in our natural condition, we are unable to help ourselves. And also, there's nothing particularly special about us that we should accomplish anything. Uh, so this is a really humbling story for, for God's people, but at the same time, it's an exalting story for God's people because God says, I am going to rescue you. So what does this mean to be that we, when we read this chapter, what does it tell us about who, who we are as God's people? It tells us that we are the rescued, beloved nation of God. And then finally, what does the story tell us about how to live as God's people? This story tells us that when God tells us to do something, we should do it. But to realize that it's God accomplishing the work through us. So many times we become fearful in life about our own abilities to accomplish things. You know, do I have the ability to do this, that, or the other thing? And the answer is no, in many cases. You do not necessarily have a natural inherent ability or one that you've cultivated over time. But what does God say? But I will be with you. So when God is with you, you will accomplish things for his kingdom. Now, think about this, though. Moses goes down to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no. Moses says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no. 
Moses says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no, wait, we can do this all day. In fact, that's what it felt like for Moses. Bang on your head against a brick wall. And yet, God is with Moses. And as we talked about before, God is accomplishing a, a purpose through the rejection. So sometimes when you do the work of God, it doesn't look like success as far as the world is concerned. But if you're doing the work of God, it's a guaranteed success. You, you will come out on the other end. Paul writes in Corinthians, the labor that you do is not in vain. So know that you do have God's presence and the work that you do matters. Your work as Sunday school teachers matters immensely. And God is accomplishing his purposes through your teaching. So, yeah, who, who, are, who are you that you should be a Sunday school teacher? Well, here's your answer. God was present with you. He's teaching those lessons with you. You, um, you just need to read the word. Let the Holy Spirit do what, what he does best. God bless you as you, uh, as you talk about burning bushes this week.